here. DeepMind has made several leaps forward and ventured into a multitude of new products and projects beyond the success of beating, every one of you heard it, the world's best Go player such as AlphaFold, which solved a biological a biologic problem, in pro problem in protein folding. Only recently, DeepMind's latest multitasking AI system, Gato, was launched. Colin. What is DeepMind? Give us a little insight. Um, well, DeepMind is the world leader in artificial intelligence. And actually, our, our mission is to solve intelligence to advance science and benefit humanity. And we have uh, an amazing team of people all the way around the world, some of the world's best minds in AI, um, both working on fundamental research and applying AI to real world problems, which is where I come into this. Yeah. What are the real world problems you're working on? Uh, well, a range of different problems, and one of the ones that I'm really excited about recently, actually, is a piece of AI we call AlphaFold. So AlphaFold is technology that allows you to predict the three-dimensional structure of proteins. You can kind of think of proteins as the building blocks of life. What AlphaFold does is allows you to predict the three-dimensional structure of them, which allows you to advance treatments for diseases such as cancer and dementia in a a more systematic and faster way. And actually, it used to take, before AlphaFold, it used to take years of painstaking work and millions of dollars of equipment to map just one protein. With AlphaFold, we're now doing millions of proteins in minutes. So we've gone from years to minutes. It's really quite incredible. And I think the potential for drug discovery, therefore, is absolutely immense. So that's a really exciting example, I think, of AI. Give another example. Uh, another great example, which actually is quite close to my heart, is uh, an example called WaveNet. Uh, this is a text-to-speech technology that we developed. And um, it kind of, at a very personal level, it, it hit me because uh, Tim Shaw, an amazing football player, an inspirational ALS researcher, lost his voice to ALS. It's a terrible neurodegen neurodegenerative disease. And we were able to give him not just any voice back, but his own voice. Um, Tim, when he, was, um, when he was playing football, he used to like doing uh, kind of video recordings with other players, and we captured those, and we were able to use those plus our model to give him back his voice. I remember watching Tim and his family um, around their kitchen table as we showed them the voice for the first time, and it was, uh, it was a pretty powerful moment. Isn't it the beginning of a new uh, era of, of in our life? that speech technology um, will go over text? Um, anyway, I think speech is a very natural way for us all to communicate. And when we developed WaveNet, um, speech technology at that point, I think it was pretty good, but it still didn't find, sound very human. And we want to interact with human voices. So I think things like WaveNet will begin to bring speech more into our dialogue. Um, I personally find text is also a very effective means of communicating. I enjoy um, interacting with text on my phone. Um, but I think as we look to the future now, we will increasingly interact with text-based systems. And you may be familiar with um, large language models. So there's been a recent surge of AI, which are trained on very large corpuses of text. And they can do amazing things. You can ask them all sorts of questions, and they can come out with immensely creative answers. So I think uh, large language models combined with things like WaveNet will begin to move us towards AI assistance, perhaps, that will be increasingly effective. It's fascinating, Colin. I, um, maybe it's an, an, um, an, an courageous comparison, but remember, not don't remember, but you know, 550 years ago, a guy named Gutenberg invented the movable letters. And we all know what happens then. We all have our books, we have everything. I, I think it's, it will be an revolutionize our, our education system, our business system, everything. I, I, mean, I think you're right. What I imagine is that as these AI systems become more and more powerful and learn more and more about us, we'll be able to interact with them in ways that will be incredibly productive. Um, so I flew from the UK to uh, Munich yesterday, and the number of steps I had to go through to book my flight, I had to kind of download my COVID pass, I had to upload my COVID pass, I had to sign in, I had to check in. 
Um, if I had an assistant that I could talk to that could do all of those things, just that would make my life so much easier. And that's just one really simple example, Stephanie. Mm, it's, it's fascinating. Um, Colin, how do I um, imagine the company? You, how many members, so how many um, co-workers do you have? How, how is it organized? So I joined Deep Minds, I think, just over seven and a half years ago. Um, and I think there were about 100 people when I joined, and we were all based in London. Um, we were founded in London, actually. It's kind of the spiritual home. Dennis, who you mentioned yeah. earlier, was born in London. Now we're 1,500 people, roughly. Only, only 1,500. And doing such an impact to our life, to our culture. Yeah, I mean, Amazing. it is. Um, and it's, it's the fact we've been able to combine, I think, in a way that kind of combines the best of academia and, and how companies work to bring together the best minds in the world to work on AI. And we're also extremely grateful for, for being able to work with Google. So um, a lot of the work I Why do, is it so? Why is it so? So I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of the work I do is searching for AI breakthroughs and matching them to problems in the real world so we can bring real world, real world impact. Um, in fact, I joke sometimes it's a bit like running a dating service where you have uh, AI researchers on one side looking for problems, and you have problems looking for AI solutions on the other side. So DeepMind probably has the biggest bank of AI solutions of kind of pretty much any company in the world. On Say it again. It's amazing. The biggest bank? The biggest bank of AI solutions of any company in the world. I think it's pretty incredible. If you look at the exhaust of what's coming out of DeepMind, I'm sure it's kind of created many, many companies in its own right. And so what I get to do is match those solutions to problems in Google. And Google is an amazing marketplace of problems. If you think of the breadth and scale of Google, so I can take AI solutions from DeepMind, put them into place in Google, and that actually scales out to billion, you know, billions of people that we get to enrich their lives. I never thought of Google as a marketplace for problems. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly the way I think about it. So as I said, it feels like I'm running a dating service between problems and solutions. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. What are the biggest challenges for you within the company? Um, well, when I first joined at 100 people, um, it was kind of still a startup. And in fact, we still think about ourselves as a startup. And when you grow from 100 to 1,000 and beyond, you kind of go through these kind of stage gates where you have to think about scaling. And what I think actually really surprised me is that we've been able to scale our core research model really effectively through those stage gates. We kind of arrange ourselves like this. We have an overall mission of solving intelligence to advance science and benefit humanity. And then we kind of pose these periodic grand challenges that direct our research towards that overall mission. And we allow then people to somewhat self-assemble towards those goals so they can kind of select which goal they find most exciting. And that's meant we've been able to scale from 100 people to 1,000 people and beyond, actually with very few kind of friction points, which actually I wouldn't have predicted at the beginning. I think from my perspective, Steffi, it's getting increasingly difficult to keep track of all the amazing research innovation that's happening and matching that to the problems. Um, and so one of the things I'm thinking about with my team is actually using our own AI to start to do that matching service, so like an automated dating service. Your own AI, what does this mean? So um, currently I have a team of amazing people that um, search through this bank of AI solutions and then match it to the problems. What I would like to see is us building our own AI system that can begin to do that itself. This is a really creative process, by can the way. Can do it by itself. Yes, wow. exactly. Autonomously. Yeah, it's kind of like a kind of meta problem. So um, rather than my team having to do this, if we can build an AI system that's able to identify the research that relates to a particular problem, then we can start to automate our own internal processes, which I think is really powerful. It's kind of AI powering AI. AI pairing AI. I mean, what we just hear, it's, it's the future of work, isn't it? I think it? so. I think so, yeah. It's AI pairing AI. Um, Colin, many people are a little bit afraid of this kind of future of work, this kind of future of um, speech to text, this kind of future or revolution you are spearheading. What do you say then? Well, I think the... I mean, I believe the exceptional promise of AI, we need to pay exceptional care as well. You know, this is really powerful technology. And we're planning for success here. We're planning for a future that is AI enabled. And so we need to kind of 
really plan for that now. Think about what that might look like now and bring together the smartest minds to start to think about that. Who I mean, are the smartest minds? Yeah, I'll tell you in a second, but let me, okay. let, me, uh, <laughs> let, me uh, let me, let me just finish this thought because this is really important. Um, this is really too big and too important, as you yeah. say, certainly to move fast and break things, and that is why we have these smart minds. So within DeepMind, we have lots of internal processes to think about what we call pioneering responsibly. We have a multidisciplinary team from all sorts of different backgrounds, ethicists, scientists, neuroscientists, and we also draw on experts from outside as well. So whenever we're developing a new piece of technology, let's take the text-to-speech example um, that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. We really recognized the potential for good there in helping people with speech impairments, for example, but we also preemptively recognized the potential for misuse for deceptive purposes. So before we go ahead and release that, we internally debate that, and we debated that at length in leadership forums, in dedicated working groups, and with external specialists. Uh, another example, AlphaFold, the technology that can predict the three-dimensional structure of proteins, as we were developing that, we consulted with probably more than 30 external experts from biology, human rights, pharma, research, and others to make sure that we were really understanding the benefits but also mitigating the risks. So that's really important. Um, actually, other brilliant people, I should, I should give some credit to the team because I think it's really important that the people building AI reflect broader society. That's really important. And there's a number of things you can do there to make that happen. Uh, one of them is invest in education and community efforts. And we do that at DeepMind. We've invested probably, I don't know, probably 50 million pounds or more in scholarships and sponsorships with amazing organizations like Women in Machine Learning and the African Deep Learning and Dabba. That's the uh, biggest M uh, machine learning community in Africa. So that's super important. Super. What, is the what about the smart people? What makes, makes them smart? Um, I think the group of people that we've brought together, you know, they all come from amazing academic institutes. They're all the kind of top of their game in their particular discipline. And they've all been extremely successful as individuals. But what I think really makes them super smart is the fact we combine them with other people at DeepMind in a really special way in this kind of top-down and bottom-up formation that I mentioned earlier. Because there are many people trying to do similar work. I think, I believe, when you come to DeepMind, you probably certainly 2x, maybe 10x your productivity because of the connectivity that you have to other people at DeepMind, other brilliant brains. So I think it's the environment that we create that makes them super smart, as well as them being super smart, of course, already. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, thank you so much. I could talk to you forever because it's, I'm so interesting, interested in your company. I think this company really makes a difference for the world. And imagine only 1,500 people make, made a difference for the world. I learned so much of organizing a company, and there is our HR officer of Berda, Katharina. Did you listen to him? We have to get a diverse team <laughs> of brilliant minds to Berda. Here are sitting some of them. Colin, it was fun. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.